packet pushers. Hello, welcome to the Network Automation Nerds podcast, where we explore the latest in network automation from a practitioner's perspective. I'm your host, Eric Cho, a network engineer who loves everything about network automation. And joining me today in co-hosting is Drew Connor Murray. Hello, Drew. Hey, Eric. Today, we're talking to Austin and Karthik from Nile. They're our sponsors for this episode. A very well-known, distinguished engineer from the public cloud space used to say this all the time, the network is in my way. And today, folks from Nile are going to tell us how Nile could get the network out of the way so we can all move on with our lives. We're really looking forward to learning about Nile, so let's dive right in. Austin, can you tell us a little bit about Nile and what is the problem that we see? Yeah, so Nile just at a very high level, we'll get into some more details as we go through this, um, but at a very high level, what we're set out to solve is, you know, really what a lot of folks look at as the consumption gap problem that exists in a lot of different areas of IT today. You know, there's so much cost, so much innovation, so much complexity, so much need for, you know, very, you know, for a number of resources, expertise that ultimately organizations just are, are unable to keep up. Right. And the business suffers because of it. Most organizations are not in the business of IT, but they need IT to move the business forward. And if the business isn't getting enough budget, if the business isn't getting enough resources, it's not getting enough time. Something's suffering. Right. And if you look at this, this isn't a new problem statement. Uh, starting 15, almost 18 years ago, you know, cloud has really come to the forefront and said, listen, this problem statement has to fundamentally be solved. If uh, organizations are not getting the value out of their investments and it's having a negative impact on the business, Something's got to change, right? So the disruption it came, and that disruption came, you know, by the way of to put it in simplistic terms, you know, let the cloud, you know, the IaaS vendors, the PaaS vendors, the SaaS vendors take away all the cost, take away all the complexity. The way I put it is take away all the burden, but yet give the customers the control and visibility they need to do what they need to do with the technology to move the business forward at the pace of the business, without all of that you know, complexity and, and cost and, and burden. And ultimately that allows organizations to free up budgets, focus on things that matter, free up resources to focus on things that matter um, and move into the, the the realm of consuming technology, if you will, than trying to, you know, buy, build and operate every single aspect of it themselves. That's why none of it exists. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting because uh, when we talk about the cloud, we usually separate between on-prem and the cloud. And uh, now you're not making that differentiation. So how did you come to your approach for the solution that you just talked about? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of look at it and, you know, there are, has been this concept of hybrid cloud out there as well. Right, where it's not just cloud. I can't do everything in the cloud. I can't ship everything to the cloud. You know, for networking, which is what we're in the space of, we're not going to uh, move everything to the cloud and forward all packets to the cloud and police everything in the cloud. Some aspect of it needs to sit on prem. Right. So if you look at some storage compute solutions, you know, there's hybrid cloud solutions where some components live on prem, right? But it's a vertically integrated stack from the cloud. You know, piece of it all the way through to the on-prem hardware. It's managed that way. It's lifecycle um, supported that way. It's consumed that way from a customer perspective. If you take that hybrid cloud concept and apply it to networking, that's the model that we've come out with. We basically said, listen, what if we can get rid of all that cost, complexity, and burden? What if we can purpose build a networking stack that delivers predictable outcomes to the customers, eliminates all that burden, keeps pace with the customer's business. They don't have to deal with the security, the complexity, the scale, the cost, the refreshing, the end of life, what have you. We take care of all of that, right? And we deploy our cloud networking on-prem to a customer managed by our back-end automation that we'll get into as we go through this. But then we hand the keys to the customer, kind of like an EC2 instance, if you think about it that way, where customers get that EC2 instance, they consume it from Amazon, and then they do what they need to with that storage compute. They build their own custom workload, their own custom application. They're given the control to do that. And they're given the visibility to support that custom you know, workload application. And if they need some of that to be on-prem, that's where hybrid cloud comes into play. Okay, so you said a couple of things here I want to make sure I dig into to understand. So you're talking about you, you sell a customer gear, networking gear that they have on-prem, but it's managed via the cloud. Let me let me clarify, Drew, because there's an important point there. We yep. sell customers a networking service, right? Mm -hmm. We don't sell gear because if I think about the problem statements that we're starting to, that we're set up to solve, buying gear is the beginning part of the problem that exists in mm -hmm. today's world. Right. I've got to own, buy an asset. I've got to fit it into a budget envelope. 
right? I, I don't get an infinite budget. I can't afford everything I want. So if I've got to fit it into a budget envelope, how many APs can I afford? How many switches can I afford? Can I afford the visibility solution? Can I afford the AI, op, AI op solutions? Can I afford the network management? Can I afford the security? Can I afford all these licenses? And the answer is always no. I got to fit something into a budget envelope, which means right away the network starts off you know, with a bunch of compromises in it. It's not going to perform or be secured as well as I would like it to be and be able to operationalize, all because I have to buy an AP and a switch. And that asset has to sit on the books. And I've got to go do that same thing three, five, seven, ten years from now, whenever that refresh cycle comes up. We want to get rid of that. All the trade-offs and compromises that come along with that paradigm go away when you buy a service. You don't care and you don't buy the servers, the storage, the compute, the top of rack networking, the rack space, et cetera, from Amazon, where you get an EC2 instance, you buy storage compute and you pay for how much you use, right? And you get the scale and security that comes along with it. So you're using a cloud model and I, I said network equipment, but I, I still get some equipment from you that because we're talking about on-prem networking, I need switches, I need APs and so on. You provide that to me, but it's part of a broader service is what you're saying. That's absolutely correct. So what we've done is we our service includes everything from day zero through day N as part of the networking that our customers need. And absolutely, they need APs and switches to connect their clients, their devices and applications to. That's what we've built. We built our own hardware, you know, our own APs, our own switches, our own sensors, distribution switches, et cetera. But it has been built in that hybrid cloud type of model where the full stack is built as a solution um, and it truly has a service type of approach. Okay, so yeah. that's the second piece I wanted to ask about is you, you said you built your own stack. So we're talking about you've started from the ground up, the network OS, the the hardware and so on, and that's what you're delivering. It's custom custom product built by you and then delivered as a service. Absolutely. You know, the concepts we took to this, Drew, is, you know, if we were to just take a switch or an AP and I wanna I don't want to name, you know, competitors' names, but you know, any kind of vendor that out there that's out there today. I would have to inherit all the complexity, all the different patches, all the different end of life cycles, all the different configurations, all the different APIs, et cetera, and try to stitch all that together. That is a challenge today in every customer environment, right? right. Um, and as soon as one thing changes, all my automation has to be fixed up and you know to catch up with that. We basically said, listen, let's first start with defining, since I'm not selling APs or switches, let's start with defining you know, products that are enterprise grade, have the best capability, the best performance, et cetera. And let's deploy that everywhere. Let's deploy it in such a way, since we're not selling APs and switches, that it has the most capacity, the most resiliency, the most performance, because it, it's free of trade-offs. It's actually operationally efficient for me to go deploy the same hardware in the same architecture everywhere, whether a customer needs it or not, right? Same thing goes along with the software stack, right? If I can build a cloud-native software stack, Right, that has the protocols, the capabilities, the segmentation, security that customers need without any of the complexity, then I can choose one of the 20 different routing protocols and one of the tw you know, 20 different um, layer two protocols and one of the 20 different, you know, whatever. You, you kind of get where I'm going here and lock it down to make it that. So now I have a common software architecture across all our customers. That enables us to then deliver predictable outcomes at scale because I become really operationally efficient in tuning and optimizing and patching and upgrading and scaling everybody's environment. The bug scrubs are gone for all intents and purposes, right? The patching has gone for all intents and purposes. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm just wondering because the way that you described it is, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. And I was wondering, Karthi, as a customer who ordered the Nile services, can you take us through the experience, let's just say, you know, I need to order, I need to refresh my network for my campus or my edge. What What is that experience like? What do I click and choose and how do I get the PO paid? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. So when when, the, when a customer, when they're about to start up, start with the Nile service, they go to the Nile, what we call it as Nile Autopilot, and uh, they go to that portal and then they sign up for the service. It's like, it's a true SaaS experience. Once they sign up for the service, then you know, the backend systems, they take over. They are automatically, you know, given a set of, uh, you know, steps that our installation partners would do, uh, which starts with, you know, discovery of their sites. And uh, that is gathering what kind of equipment they have, what kind of switcher they have, what kind of how many users they have and things like that. And also a good survey of their entire uh, environment, what we call it as a site survey, <clears throat> right? And uh, so this is done by our partners. And once the partners they get in, typically take it takes a day or two, depending upon the size of the environment. 
once that's that's done then we automatically generate the bill of materials and you know all the all the necessary instructions for cabling and everything through a technologies which we'll talk about it um, yeah, later and then the service magically you know the equipment magically shows up in their door within a couple of days and it's a true doordash kind of an experience is what we are striving for right uber doordash kind of an experience and then the service is up and running um within three or four days so the moment they sign up to the night portal and the the moment the service is up and running it's just a matter of three or four days okay and then after that once the service is up and running we engage in what what we call it as a sign off process where that is also completely automated where we automatically discover what kind of devices they have and things like that and we show them that hey all those devices are able to um, you know work properly with our network in certain cases we will help them with migrating those devices into the night um, systems we, uh, occasionally we will do that and then once everything is done then the the access they have is the nile autopilot application where they get to you know add additional devices they get to see their uh, you know uh, their devices their users and they and they get to set their security policies and things like that so uh, the one key thing that's different from other networking vendors is that the thing about the networking gear itself that is network access service and nile access service that is completely our responsibility so that means they don't get to see you know the APs and the command lines and their, you know, software and things like that, that completely taken over by us. What we tell them is, hey, everything is up and running for you guys. And then this, and uh, you know, this is the performance guarantees, right? That we guarantee right away. And then that's all you need, you know, you guys need to care about when it comes to service and all your clients are, you know, connected. So from an experience standpoint, they, si they sign up in the Nile portal and then within three or four days, equipment is up and running with the clear performance guarantee set up for them and all the client devices connected for them. And all they need to uh, care about going forward is just how the client devices connected. So I want to double click a bit on the sign up experience as well. So you mentioned partner, right? So um, <clears throat> that maybe, you know, the customers in the location where there's no partner readily available. So what kind of information is required for the customer? Maybe not ideal, but, you know, that they could provide for you to you know, kind of do the virtual site survey, so to speak. Yeah, it's the 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 customer do, the customer need not provide any any information, right? So we have partner network all across the world, okay. and uh, so we uh, we engage in what we call it as a customer site discovery process, okay? okay. And that information is specifically uh, involves things like where are their IDFs are located, where are the MDFs are located, where in uh, how, which firewall they're using, how much you know which which ports are available and where are they connected how's their cabling look like and things like that right so that's the discovery process and then the site survey is something looking at you know where the users are congregated mm -hmm. and where do we need to keep the access points what kind of a ceiling they have and things like that right so that is also done by our you know our partners right and in many cases if it is a brownfield deployment these informations are already available we will use that but in thing in things in scenarios where they're not available we will have our our partners go and do for us. And I think just to so you'll, you'll send someone on site to actually do a survey right. to get yeah. a sense of the space they're working in, That's the right. materials, yeah. the issues that could cause interference and so on, optimal placement of APs, et cetera. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of to elaborate on that, Drew, you know, the sign up experience, as Karthik pointed out, is where a lot of automation happens to try to, or in, in an attempt to deliver those predictable outcomes that, you know, we talked about before. Karthik kind of alluded to some of the automation, but I, I think it's worthwhile double clicking on it real quick. That, that person that we send out there to do that survey, right? They're actually feeding information into an app that's part of our cloud systems. That app, that data that's gathered, you know, validating AP placement, the measurements on AP on a stick, the walling material, what's in the closet, rack space, power, cooling, cabling, uplinks, all that good stuff that everybody expects to do during a survey, that's fed in through this app, feeds into our cloud, into a common data structure, um, and then our backend systems start doing some work with that. One of the things that spits out from that is what is commonly known as a high level design, but we call it a Nile plan deployment. That Nile plan deployment sits in our operation systems and Carthics probably allude to or talk about this a little bit later on, but it starts there and it's waiting for the network equipment to be installed. So all of a sudden this digital twin becomes a live version of what's actually being deployed at the site, right? That high level design that Nile plan deployment then automates the bomb 
right? Because we're not selling APs or switches, the bomb is in extrapolation or ex gets extracted from that survey and that high level design, and then further gets extracted to what would be commonly called a low level design, which is the design document. That all gets fed right back into that app. So when the stuff ships and it's on site and we send a dispatch installer, they're sitting in the app, there's a work order, hey, install the gateway, install the access switch, install AP number one. They scan a QR code, it activates it against the cloud, they put it in their place, they take a picture, our Nile plan deployment sitting in our operations center is comparing what they just did to what it was supposed to be planned and flagging mm -hmm. if there's any deviations and asking the installer to correct it before they leave. There's that level mm -hmm. of automation that goes into all this. It's okay. like Ikea, but with a, a pair of eyes watching over you and <laughs> more AI-assisted Ikea. That, that, that's, that's a good that's analogy. That's exactly that's a picture. Yeah. And with Ikea, I have to set up the furniture. It sounds like I don't have to do that if I'm going with Niall. Somebody comes in and sets up the furniture for me and puts it in the right room. And you use the furniture. And yeah. Yeah. And then I use the furniture. Yeah. You don't have <laughs> to. Um, yeah. You, you On the consumption model, the, the amount of time you sit on that sofa, that you only pay for those. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta figure out how to commoditize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I need to get off my my uh, IKEA comparison for now, just just because um we're we're still in the technical realm. So, um, everything you talked about sounds great, but you know, as a network engineer who's been you know rack and stack switches and routers all my life, and you know climbing under the chair plug in that Cat Five, it makes me a little nervous to offload all of these work to another company. And I think a common question that pops in people's mind would be. How does it help the on-site network engineers or network engineer who are currently doing some of the jobs that now is going to automate for them? Yeah, so let me um, touch on that first, Eric, and part the can add some color commentary. First, you know, a little bit about me. People can look up on LinkedIn. I've been doing this. I've been in network engineering for over 26 years, mainly on the vendor side, but been with a couple of uh, large customers as well. And I think any network engineer that's working, you know, for customers, that, you know, in the business, you know, a lot of them are frustrated, frankly you know, because they're not given enough budget to do things the way they think they need to be done and the way they want them to do them. They're not given enough resources to do things the way they want it, they think they need to be done. They're not given enough time to do things the way they need to be done. And the business isn't slowing down. The IT you know, business initiatives are not slowing down, right? So they're spending way too much time dealing with chasing problems on the network, users that are frustrated, chasing ghosts, when they know they could probably fix it if they were given the budget, the time, the resources to do it. But the business isn't slowing down, so something's got to give, right? And I don't like doing things that, you know, I'm not proud of, right? And, not, you know, I'm like, I want to do things the best. And if only <laughs> I was given the time, resource, and budget. If that's the case, right, in many environments, and we fundamentally believe, and I've, again, I've been doing this for a long time, you just can't throw enough cost and resources at this problem to solve it. Right. And what's happened in IP networking for the last 30 years is there's been new solutions, but it's added cost for that new solution with added complexity, another resource, another training manual, another user guide, et cetera. And I would dare say, and this might come across a little bit wrong, Eric, that automation is another thing that kind of gets piled on that, right? I, have need, I need to train on it. I need a resource. I need budget to buy a tool. I've got to need time to figure out the problems I'm going to solve. And hopefully nothing changes for me to keep up with that. And hopefully I'm not you know, handling a bunch of network-related escalation issues that I, I can actually spend time on this. If that's the state, if that is the problem statement, if I can eliminate the bug scrubs, the patching, the tuning, the optimization, the securing, et cetera, of the network, and I gave you a network stack that was always ready to meet your business needs, and you don't have to deal with all of that low-level stuff, if you will, right? And it just worked, and I could free up your budgets, free up your time, free up your resources. And by the way, I freed up the time you need to solve some of the problems that I already inherently solve with all the automation I build in. And then I hand you clean data, a clean environment, a deterministic environment that's free of those issues that you can then automate the stuff around that. To me, I think a lot of network engineers would like to hear that story. Yeah, let's talk about that because it sounds like, okay, I understand the value prop of, yeah, you know, I've got a greenfield environment, I need a network set up, you come in and do that for me. But what then happens during the operational phase, day-to-day -day operations? What do I as the network engineer on site do versus what do you as my service provider do? A lot of people, when they hear this for the first time, they think it's a managed service, frankly, right? Because mm -hmm. I think the way network as a service has been defined in the industry to date is it's managed services, outsourcing and leasing. Mm -hmm right? Because those are the constructs I need to put around today's technology. But if right. this is natively built, you know, basic, and by the way, if you think about managed services, one of the reasons, 
you know, we kind of get bulked into managed services. And one of the negatives of managed services is as a managed service provider, if I was, I would have to take away all control. Because if I let you change one thing, the house of cards is going to fall apart and I can't deliver an SLA, right? Right, right. But if I purpose build a stack the way that I've been talking about how we purpose build a stack, I can design it and deliver it in such a way that I handle all the burden, but I give the control back to you. You, the network engineer, you know your environment way better than I do, right? We want to give you a better network foundation to build off of, but you know the SSIDs, you know the integrations, the DHCP and Radius, you know your security postures and your NAC and everything else, you know your operational workflows and your ITSM integrations and everything you want to do unique to your business. I'm giving you control, much like that EC2 comparison, to be able to do that. And I'm giving you the visibility to support your users and devices and applications that are running on this network, right? It's a co- very much a co-managed type of model, if you if you want to look at that mm-hmm. way. You want to add anything to that? Yeah. So um, the, the important thing is that's why we call the our applications as Nile Copilot, because we are that we are specifically using the term called Copilot to 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 convey that we are here to help the network engineers by taking all these low level things that Austin talked about away. And then so that they, they can focus on something much higher level, much, much is a lot more interesting, which is, you know, taking care of all the other, you know, ideas and integrations and security postures and things like that. Yeah. So can you give me one example of specifically what network engineer used to manage? And I, I heard uh, DHCP, right? So if we use DHCP as a, as an example, so I used to have to manage the DHCP server. I, I, I have some kind of IPM allocation uh, and so on. So how does that experience different now uh, working with Nile? Yeah. So you, if you're a network administrator who owns a DHCP server, right. by the way, we do offer our own DHCP server as well. So, but, but, but let's take the example of a network administ- administrator owning their own DHCP server, right? So what we do is we, mo- in, we monitor the DHCP transactions with zero configuration. The, all, all they need to do is just bring up all of the clients, okay, and, and then we immediately start monitoring the DHCP transactions. And uh, and we also monitor the DHCP servers availability, and also we monitor the DHCP servers performance, like how quickly it is responding. And how are we doing it? There is no script. No one is going to configure it. And uh, it, they're all automatically built in through our what we call it as an important component in the, in the Nile services block called, called headend, okay? And then what the network administrator gets in this case is that they get two things. One, they get visibility into what a DH, you know, how the DHCP server is performing. So if they go to the Nile co-pilot, which is our portal, and there they it will clearly show them that hey, you know, these are you know, this is how your DHCP, you know, your DHCP server availability is this. And this mm-hmm. is how fast that it is performing in terms of you know some critical performance measurements such as latency. And then we also tell them if things go wrong, and let's say a DHCP server became unavailable, we alert the network administrators right through mm-hmm. the Nile Copilot. There's an alerting mechanism that we built in, and uh, and we uh, and then that alert can be integrated through email, webhooks, or any of the ITSM systems as well. So all the network administrators, if they're managing a, if they have a DHCP server, okay, from a pure DHCP server perspective, they don't have to do anything. They automatically get this, you know, monitoring, uh, you know, by design. It just comes with it, comes with the service. And the other aspect is that from a client's perspective, let's say, and we, we have seen this scenario in, in few of our customer environments, if some of the clients have challenges in communicating with the DHCP server or getting IP addresses, and you know, because the pool the pool was not fully available and things like that, we do capture that as well. And we we monitor the client traffic as well, and our head and does that. And uh, while doing that, it tells them that it, you know it, it it alerts the IT administrator saying that hey, there are ten percent of the clients or you know X percent of the clients are seeing this issue, okay, and we see a big trend. And you may want to go and fix your, you know, your DHCP server by either changing the, uh, increasing the pool or you know, increasing the capacity and whatnot, right? So they get two things: one, pure DHCP server availability and performance, and also from a client perspective, what issues they're facing, and and they and they get to integrate with all sort of, you know, systems, email, web, Slack, and you know, ITSM systems. Anything you want to add? I think you know the DHCP example that you're kind of alluding to there is, uh, I think, a perfect example of. You know, how we've optimized within the network stack itself to eliminate the problems and provide some visibility, et cetera, eliminate config. But even that 
you know, for the automation folks that, you know, are, are working to solve problems that exist even outside the network stack, the DHCP, we've seen a number of customers now that, you know, the DHCP server, uh, the scope is exhausted, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So what if via our tele telemetry, because we're monitoring, because we're in line, because we're you know, monitoring the, the server and everything and the transactions like Karthik mentioned, what if the alert that spits out either be a webhook or an event collector or API or some other method can be captured and turned into, hey, scope is exhausted. Let's automatically increase the scope at this site. Problem solved, right? Yeah. So what happens if um, the you you get disconnected from the on-prem equipment? Because it sounds sounds like it's very tightly integrated. You're co-piloted in, into the Nile uh, system on the back end, but what if the the disconnection happened? Yeah, I think. Uh, I'll take that. Yeah, I, I'll take that, Austin. So our systems are built in such a way that the network uh, performance of the service guarantee that by itself stands on its own. It does not need our cloud systems to deliver that guarantee. Okay, so if for some reason the on prem loses connection with our head end, but the rest of the inter internet is working. Mm -hmm. the service will continue to function. And we have built in enough mechanisms to ensure that. Okay, that's number one. And number two is, during that time of loss of connectivity, there is enough uh, buffering that we built in each of our service elements, whether it's, whether it's head-end or our uh, switches or our access points, to buffer all the collected data. And we have in we have capabilities to buffer up to like eight hours or maybe even more, right? Based on the type of the system. And then once the network system comes up, by the way, it never happens for eight hours. But once the things come up, we send that buffer data to the cloud. So and then we process it with the lag, and and then we tell the customers like what happened, you know, what happened to the system while we lost the network connectivity, so that the customer doesn't lose the visibility at any point in time. They may get a delayed visibility because of the, you know, for, for the. You know, for the time when the connectivity is lost, but mm -hmm. they will never lose the visibility aspect of it. All the while, guaranteeing that the service continues to function. All of our, uh, you know, service guarantees, or you know, we continue to provide those guarantees, irrespective of the fact that whether, whether the cloud is connected or not. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. On just kind of the visibility portion and the functionality portion, you can separate the two. Uh, so it's a separation of concerns in that approach. So I was, you know, I've, I've obviously I, I read about you guys. You guys are very much a uh, up and coming story and interesting story, different approach. So there's some interesting customers, you know, uh, problems that you've solved. Is there any th interesting customer problem that, that stood out in your mind that you could share with us that kind of exemplified the Nile, the Nile way, so to speak? Yep. Austin, you want, you want to take a few? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take one. You take yeah, one? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think one of the first things uh, I'm going to share one particular customer. Um, I don't know if we should name names. I guess we can name drop. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, Stanford University is a customer of ours, right? Oh, nice. you know, we're big in higher ed because if you think about the problem statements that we solve, lack of budget, lack of resources. By the way, they have the noisiest user population in the world, right? Hopefully, no students are listening. But <laughs> everybody wants that that uh, that wireless to be on and working and high performing and giving them everything they need. Um, it's a very demanding environment, and as you can imagine, all these different types of users, devices, et cetera, it's very heterogeneous environment. We solve a lot of pain in that world, you know. Just by the way we built this in Stanford, you know, they really had two things that I think exemplify, um, you know, the innovation we built in and the outcomes we can drive. One is the amount of time that their small team, we have the computer sciences building, um, we're expand, you know, looking to expand into other areas of campus, but they're a relatively small team. I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but they were spending a significant amount of time troubleshooting user connectivity issues. Uh -huh. right? And as you can imagine, usually the, the network is always the one to be blamed. Right, it's always the network's fault, even though it's not, um, uh, even though it might not be. So you know, spend a lot of time trying to create a trail of breadcrumbs, mine through a you know a stack of needles, looking for you know a needle, um, and it takes a long time to troubleshoot issues. And the way that you know those calls typically go is, I get a call, I don't get a lot of information, the network's broken, I don't know what to do with it, so it sits on the back burner. If I get five more calls on the next day or the next week, then I know something's wrong and now I start really starting to dig. And it might take two weeks to try to find a problem. Instead of innovating and working on school challenges, school priorities, school strategies, they were focused on troubleshooting the network. Right. By virtue of our approach, we virtually eliminated the number of network-related tickets down to zero. 
in their oh, environment. Wow. Down to zero. Right. By the way, and you know, even for the tickets that existed elsewhere in the network um, services like DHCP, Radius, DNS, um, in the internet connectivity, or in the applications themselves that the users care about, the teachers, staff, faculty care about as well, that we're monitoring and providing that proactive alerting for, even the mean time to detection and mean time to resolution of those have come down dramatically. Right. So that's outcome number one. Outcome number two is one particular issue that they were chasing was um, they wound up. Uh, you know, spending, I think it was two to three months on different tech calls through different levels of escalation, trying to chase down, you know, exactly what was going on. And it was a problem that was plaguing users for a long time. And it was intermittent, what have you. They finally, after two to three months, got to one particular tech escalation engineer. I won't name the vendor, but um, that there was like, oh, yeah, you guys are missing that command. There's one command, one CLI command. If you put that in, solves all the problems. And sure enough, mm -hmm. it solved all the problems. And why did it take three months to figure out it was one CLI command? The problem with that traces all the way back to the fact that there is a, a config, right? That, you know, everybody tries to create golden configs and all that other stuff. And once there's a patch, do I have to optimize and test the golden config? And if there's a new feature, am I applying the new feature with right best practices? What's turned on by default? What's not turned on by default? If this problem was found at another customer two years ago, and it's now a fixed bug in version XYZ, is that the version I'm running? Did I do a bug scrub? Did I apply that patch? There's so many tentacles to the root of that problem. But that problem, because we've eliminated I want to say we eliminated config, but we eliminated config on the network stack. Customers still get their portal and get to put their intent-based config in there, and the software extrapolates it into the config that's needed on the network equipment. But there is no console support. There is no CLI. There is no syntax. Uh, there's no web UI. There's no SSH. There's no telnet. All of that goes away. The software, if I fix a bug in customer one, it gets rolled out to everybody. right? And in a cloud-native way, we can do that in most cases that it's hitless. right? So the network in and of itself never experiences that type of problem. Yeah, I think you just said something that's going to make a lot of engineers be like, what? You said there's no CLI. Can you drill into that a little more? That We can't just let that walk past us. Yeah, yeah no, no, so, no, so truly there is no CLI. There's no golden config. There is no config file. Um, there's nothing, right? And we do that for two reasons. I'll explain the config capability we give to customers, right? Because remember, this, this is co-managed. We give co-pilot you know, capabilities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If you think about config, it's kind of funny, you know, for everybody that's been in the networking industry for a while, when I take a switch out of a box, the first thing I got to do typically is secure that access to that console port, take secure access to that config, set up TAC acts, set up privilege, you know, rights and all this other stuff, right? That's a, that's a, this amount of config in a CLI in and of itself in a separate server and a bunch of config on that server. That's not only config and complexity that has to be maintained and patched and updated and all this other stuff, but it's also a threat vector. If that can be bypassed, then any kind of controls you put in that config for security of the network, anybody can bypass, right? So it's a threat vector and it's an area for misconfiguration. If I eliminate those two, the network's now more secure. There's no need to worry about user guides and CLI syntax and misconfigurations, whether they're unintentional or malicious, all of that goes away, right? The TCO and the ROI benefits of my solution go up because maybe I don't need the TACX server anymore. Right, because the network doesn't. The, when you take my API, my switch out of the box, every port set up to do um, security by default um, instead of having to build it all in. And um, there is no console port, as we mentioned. Now there is a QR code that the installer with the app QR code scans these things, activates it, it activates, gets your tenant, and in that tenant is where your quote unquote config lies. Right. Instead of having config templates, golden configs, and a bunch of CLI that you have to put in a template and push out. You basically say, hey, at this site, I want these four segments, the IoT segment, the point of sale segment, the employee segment, the guest segment, right? And I wanted to use this DHP server, and I want these subnets to apply to this segment for this site and this one for this site. And it, the software just takes that and pushes it to the right network elements and sets it up automatically, right? So they get their config without all of the complexity and the, the security concerns. So, Drew, now I have to figure out how to where to go where where do i do with all these cables this console cables that I accumulated through 20 years <laughs> uh, and always have a backup of a backup of a backup right <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. your jewelry line eric you gotta, get, you, gotta, you gotta get rid of putty as well right <laughs> no more putty yeah that's true that's true yeah so um 
Um, and I also like the fact that you bring up Stanford as a, as an example, as we all know, the, the home of the software defined networking, and that's near and dear to <laughs> many of a, many of our hearts on, on the very demanding users. And, you know, if, um, let's just say if you're working with Stanford, you're doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you want to add? Yeah. So yeah. I, I will add perhaps one, um, another customer completely different one. Uh, this customer is responsible for, let me say, the entire food distribution for for the entire California. Okay, and uh, and this is a very challenging customer in the sense that they they have a um, lot of old cables lying around. Okay, and they want to protect the investment. Cabling cost is actually um, it, 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 they consume significant percent when it comes to insulation, especially in the brownfield deployment, right? And uh, for us. Uh, this is a great example of Nile able to work with the customer with such a uh, in such an old installed cable, and then still we are able to deliver the service, right? And, and and let me talk about some of the challenges that we went through and how automation played a role in automatically fixing it, correcting it, and all those kind of things, right? Again, so here we uh, the custom we went and installed our equipment, and uh, we had a full you know good rendered uh, redundant architecture built in and, and all. Um, so and then. What we started doing was we started observing, and this is where the you know our intelligence comes in in the cloud, as the telemetry data about different links and you know their their errors, their CRC errors, transmitter errors, and all that starts flowing in. The intelligence in the cloud they started observing spike in one of the links, and the spike is unusual, right? It, it's uh, it, it's not it's not seasonal, it's it doesn't correlate with any sort of traffic and all, but something unusual that showed yeah. that something is wrong or something is going wrong with a particular cable. And typically what happens in other vendors that they will have to wait until the cable get replaced or, right? Uh, so what we observe, what we have it, this is the automation, this is where automation comes in. We automatically change the, our algorithm detected this. They sent the signal, right? There's no config involved. They automatically send the signal to the corresponding switches to change the routing cost on the routing protocols, you know, they reconverged, and then the table forwarding table gets updated, and then the traffic got automatically rerouted to the correct, you know, to the you know, working cable, right? This customers or the end users, they did not know about this at all. They came to know about this only when the cloud created a work order saying that, hey, this particular cable needs to be replaced with the location of where the cable is, which in which two switches it's connecting to, and then when the installer showed up one day, hey, I'm here to replace your cable. And that's when the, you know, that's the level of automation that we built in, right? And this shows our ability to work with some of the brownfield customers who are, you know, and our ability to protect their investments and also bring in automation even to those kind of customers as well. So you want to add anything, Austin? No, I think, uh, you know, the important point of the, and I want to stress the point of the story that you just made, that was a failing cable, not a failed cable. It's easy yeah. to converge around a failed cable, but how many fail lane cables do we have from 70 pound looms hanging off the front of switches, you know, in, in a rack, you know, because the cable management was, you know, a little bit sloppy over time. Um, and I think that's, you know, that happens all the time. Yeah. I was talking to a particular customer, like when they acknowledged they had a problem, it took them two weeks. Um, this is a prospect. It's not a customer to be fair. It took them two weeks when I was telling this particular story to find that exact problem, to trace it all the way back to the fail lane cable. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, we all know the the most difficult problem to troubleshoot is these uh, brownouts and uh, not. You I mean if you want to fail, fail fast, right? Like that's that's what I pray right. for, <laughs> as opposed to gradually failing. Um, so that's kind of interesting on the amount of telemetry data and the the detail that you guys can monitor and to proactively solve that issue. And um, I mean, I heard AI. Did I did I not hear that correctly? Or do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the intelligence backend? Yeah. So we have you know multiple types of intelligence in the backend, depending upon which particular problem that we we are solving. Um, we have we we use in simple streaming analytic technologies. That is, we analyze the data as and when they come in. So this particular cabling issue is one of that streaming analytics technology. As and when the stream, the data streams come in, we analyze the data. Mm -hmm. And then we also analyze the data at rest at a large scale. Um, okay. And also we have some advanced ML algorithms as well, right? And in some cases, multiple analytic technologies they come together to solve a particular problem. So in this cabling problem, 
we the streaming data was gathering continuously getting the data from the uh, from the switches and then the ml algorithms were looking for the increase the un, the abnormality in the C, in the crc errors in the cable and then to detect the failing cable as uh, as austin was mentioning and in other cases we use um a and ml to solve to automatically generate the plans, the cabling plans that Austin talked about in during the onboarding process of the customer. When the customer signs up, and when, when we gather the data, when we gather the site survey, things magically appear. The, the topology, the bill of materials, and the cabling plan, and the rack and stack plan, all of them, they magically appear. And these are like usually in 100, you know, 10, 15 pages of documents, right? And our algorithm, they automatically generate the document based on the data that is gathered, right? So there is intelligence built in multiple different, um, you know, in all the in all the different phases, depending upon different use cases that we solve. We use you know, either simple, uh, you know, simple analytics or advanced analytics such as AI or ML. Um, and again, it's all very use case driven in our case, Eric. Is this data or telemetry being, uh, I, I, by assumption, is this data, this telemetry is being collected and stored in the public cloud, in your public cloud? Yep, in our cloud. And, okay, so I also assume then you're taking steps to anonymize it, protect it, and so on. Yes, we have all the data retention policies, and we do analyze, uh, we do anonymize some of the, we automatically identify some of the PIA data, and we anonymize them, and, uh, and, and we also have strict uh, privacy policies built in as well. Yeah, we're already on, this was built from the ground up with those types of security controls in place. I mean, we're already, as a young company, we're already SOC 2, type 1, and type 2. I think type 2, three years in a row now. ISO 27001. Um, we even have capabilities where besides anonymizing or, you know, decoupling the PII from the data, anonymizing, you know, encryption and trans-encryption at rest, we even have the capability where customers can even encrypt their metadata with their own key management system if they wanted to. Yeah, that aggregation part is very, very interesting. The important thing I wanted to add is that anytime you do some sort of an analysis, at scale, um, we do not, we, we have no idea about the private information of a uh, of a user. We don't know we don't know their IP address. We don't know their host name. That's all completely anonymized. So the analysis happens completely in an in an anonymized data. But when the information is actually shown to the user, they get the right information, and that that's where the key uh, that Austin talks about comes in. So there's two levels of analysis. There's sort of local where telemetry is going to affect something in my physical layer you guys can let me know about. And then there's global where there's a software issue that uh, you see across customers that you can write a fix for and patch behind the scenes. Yeah, security, CVEs, and these kind of, you know, globally impacting, but not eventually or impact you, but not immediately. You, you get an early alert system for that. Yeah, that's correct. Use anonymized uh, aggregation uh, data. And, and, by, and by the way, real quick, Eric, if you think about that 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 view and that data and that telemetry we have, you know, across our customer base, mm -hmm. even if there is an issue, whatever the issue is, right, that maybe we didn't catch quite yet, and our SREs didn't optimize yet, or whatever it is, you know, customer calls in a ticket. We, you know, typically the first step, you know, when a customer calls in a ticket to a sport case, the person on the other side of the phone is like. Hey, what is? Can you send me your config? What's your topology look like? Can you text me a send me a text okay. support? <laughs> they have no idea what they're looking at. They have no idea what you built. They have no idea, right? Um, they got to start to build an understanding of what you've built before they can start troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. We already know all that, right? We already got the telemetry. We know the software stack. We know the architecture. We know the hard, you know, hardware stack. We've got all the history. So even if it's an intermittent issue, we've got the data bank, you know, to kind of go back and, and look at that, right? Yeah. So even the junior uh, tag or the online uh, over, uh, you know, uh, on call overnight uh, would have the same standing ground or at least similar standing ground as the senior engineer who's, you know, working there in the daytime. Yep. Yeah. So um, that makes me very interesting in learning more about Nile. So Austin, can you tell me if I want to learn more about Nile, uh, where can I go? 
Yeah, I think a, you know, a good place to start is our webpage, nasecure.com. There's a lot of webinars, a lot of testimonies, a lot of case studies on there. There's also a lot of you know, collateral you know, videos about different concepts that we've talked today, um, other concepts that exist in the platform. We, we have not touched on security today. Security is front and center, not just the security of the platform itself, but also the security that we deliver to customer environments for their users' devices application. So a lot of good information there on that. Um, pay close attention that page to our LinkedIn uh, um, uh, account, to our Twitter account, et cetera. There's going to be a big announcement on the 19th um, mm -hmm. that we're all pretty excited for. I don't want to spill the beans too much, um, but definitely stay stay tuned for something big coming soon. Nice. Anything to add, uh, Karthik? It's, it's great to share some of the things that we have built and, uh, the, again, how fundamentally our, our approach is different compared to all the other, you know, all the other approaches out there. This is, you know, oftentimes we ask the question that, hey, how is it different from scripts? Right. It, there, there is there is no script. We, we did not think of it that way at all. I mean, right. It's all script is after you, after people have built the product and released it into the wild. This is all the automation is inbuilt into our service itself and right. all towards going into us delivering those performance guarantees of, of availability, capacity and coverage. So that's the one thing I want to add. That's great. As uh, Austin and Karthik mentioned, if you're interested in knowing more about Nile, feel free to visit nilesecure.com. If you go to the slash journey site, you also see a lot of the user stories and uh, uh, testimonials and so on. We will have all those links in the show notes as well. Thank you, Austin and Karthik, for joining us today. And we thank Nile for being a sponsor. And thank you, Drew, for uh, being my co-host, uh, you know this is this has been a pleasure with all three of you. I feel very lucky to to be in the presence of of uh, the three uh, industry veterans here. And thank you, listeners, as always, for listening to this episode of Network Automation Nerds. If you reach out to Nile to find more information about their products and services, please do tell them you heard it from Packet Pushers. Connect with me and Drew on LinkedIn, or leave us a feedback on packetpushers.net/fu. We really appreciate it. Last but not least, remember that too much narrative animation will never be enough.